what would a good Baptist have believed? Lord, is that absolutely unnecessary. Priesthood of all believers, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Priesthood of all believers. So, so when he says war of words and tumult of opinions, I don't think we sometimes appreciate what we're dealing with here. Even in his own home, let's talk about that for a minute. We've got we've got a, a few little differences here. Uh, what, what are some of the dynamics of the Smith home? Lucy Max, good uh, Scottish girl. She so she's a Presbyterian. So she's attracted to Presbyterianism. Home. Which, which is, again, I believe is generally in the five points of Calvinism, including predestination. Joseph Jr. says that he's attracted to Methodism, which will be on the other, other end. And we've got Father. He's in the image of his father. Who, who's who's a, a universal guy. Unitarian. Yeah, just, yeah but, but unchurched. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, you, you can come to appreciate the, the challenge. Though Joseph Jr. knows you go to God with your questions, though he knows that spiritual experiences are real, we have some differences, not just in society, but some interesting challenges even in the family here. You know, it's interesting, after his vision, when he leans against the fireplace, mm -hmm. he says to his mother, I have found out that Presbyterianism is not true. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. He doesn't tell us what mother said. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. Probably got sent to bed. <laughs> Let's talk about uh, the significance of James 1 and 5. Um, what, what do you feel about James 1 and 5? What might be said about what, what might well be called a foreordained scripture here? Well, is it one of the things, before we get to James 1 and 5, could we talk just about the book itself for just a second? Sure. Uh, James was one of those highly debated books in the, in the councils dealing with canon. There, there are who did not want James to become part of the canon. Fortunately, the voice on the other side was stronger, and therefore when push came to shove, James was indeed placed in the canon and became a canonical book. But that disputation continued down to the days of Luther. Well, that's exactly right. He called it, what, the Epistle of Straw. Right. Mm -hmm. Why? Uh, so yeah, because it, it sounded as though... It's in opposition to what works, Paul is writing, and you've got to take one or the like other. The faith and works issue is taking mm -hmm. another poll. As it well, he's, he's saying, too, that it doesn't profess Jesus. Uh, that, that's a nicer way for uh, him to put it, but, but he didn't want to translate it. And, uh, put it in the back of the book and wouldn't mm -hmm. give it page mm -hmm. numbers. So it had a stormy past, as it were. Yes, exactly right. Uh, and, and therefore I see an opposition to the book because, as, as you I, uh, said, we, we've got a foreordained text here. Yeah. And I'm not surprised, therefore, that it, there would be some controversy to follow this. opposition as a uh, foreordained prophet. prophet. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, exactly right. Now listen to the text in context. What are you reading from? I'm reading from James. Here's something that a lot of Latter-day Saints have never done, is just read James 1 and 5 in its context. So why did you begin with verse 1 if you went down, uh, Joseph? That's, that's uh, where you've got to begin. Uh -huh. Well, first you begin with the name of the book. This is the general epistle of James. So it isn't written to a particular congregation, like many of the epistles were, but this is uh, written to uh, all of the saints. And then it begins... James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. Mm -hmm. So uh, <laughs> he's writing to, I mean, how, how in the world do you do this? You sit down on Sunday afternoon, you say, I'm going to write a letter to uh, somebody, and you write a letter to the twelve tribes <laughs> who, who are, are scattered. scattered. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And then greeting. Now, uh, I don't know how, what kind of postage you put on that, but how you address the letter. But how do you expect this message that you're going to write to get delivered? Who's going to take it? But that doesn't seem to be James's concern. Well, he has no concern That's about right. it whatsoever. It's as if he senses yeah. it'll go to all the 12 yeah. tribes. Yeah. And then he launches into this little mini-discourse on patience, which is just kind of interesting. But let patience have her perfect work, that she may be perfect and entire, wander nothing. And then it's after having said that that he makes this great announcement now, if any of you lack wisdom, he said, let him ask. Now, the setting is just remarkably Which is still, interesting. If you continue the context, it's still in the context. You pray, God will answer. Yeah. But it, that answer requires works, requires them for us to do something. It isn't simply just giving us a response to to answer a question but that allows us or gives us the responsibility to go go forth and do now based on that. Which is a qualified text too. I mean if you lack wisdom, then so if you lack right. money or you want to be more beautiful or you want to be more famous or something, 
This is the wisdom of heaven. If you want to, if you want the wisdom of heaven, then heaven's interested in responding. Mm -hmm. You see, which uh, is an excellent qualifier. Yeah. One tradition, it's a little hard to tie down, but it seems to be a pretty strong tradition, is to the effect that young Joseph heard a minister preach on James 1 and 5, and that was what motivated him to go home, look up the passage, study it over, uh, and then it had that impact. In fact, I think it's worth our time. Why don't we turn to Joseph Smith history um, and read uh, what I think is one of the great graphic descriptions of the power of pondering on scripture verses 10 let's do 10 11 and 12. Camille are you there? Mm -hmm. In the midst of this war of words and tumult of opinions I often said to myself what is to be done who of all these parties are right or are they wrong altogether if any one of them be right which is it and how shall I know it while I was laboring under the extreme difficulties caused by the contest of these parties of religionists, I was one day reading the epistle of James, first chapter and fifth verse, which reads, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. Upbraid meaning God Chew doesn't upbraid, huh? Chew out. Yeah, yeah. angry with. He won't get angry, get angry for asking. Mm -hmm. Okay, go ahead. Never did any passage of scripture come with more power to the heart of man than this did at this time to mine. It seemed to enter with great force into every feeling of my heart. Well, I need to interrupt there. You have just read one of the finest scriptural descriptions of the spirit of religion that you'll find anywhere. Yeah, the king of Birmingham power. See, what's happening here is Joseph is having a revelation that says, Joseph, will get a revelation. Mm -hmm. the revelations beget revelation. revelation. Sure. And so in a very real sense, the, the greatest revelation of our dispensation may have been this revelation that said, Joseph, go get a revelation. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah, the Holy Ghost is working on the young prophet. Uh -huh. well, look, the, way. the Holy Ghost is working through an institutional revelation to bring about an individual revelation. revelation. Well, I'll, I'll finish Start again this. Start verse 12. Okay. Never did any passage of Scripture come with more power to the heart of man than this did at this time to mine. It seemed to enter with great force into every feeling of my heart. I reflected on it again and again, knowing that if any person needed wisdom from God, I did. For how to act, I did not know. And unless I could get more wisdom than I then had, I would never know. For the teachers of religion of the different sects understood the same passages of Scripture so differently as to destroy all confidence in settling the question by an appeal to the Bible. I know you're dying to say something about that. Uh, <laughs> Brother McConkie, you had a, a look in your eye. Say something about that. I think that that is the most important uh, instruction that has ever been given to a missionary or anyone else that goes out to share the message of the gospel with those not of our faith. And in a very real sense, even with those uh, who are of our faith, and that is uh, what we need to do is uh, extract ourselves from the war of words and the tumult of opinion. And uh, we need to have uh, a religious experience that is immediate and personal. We need to do what Joseph did, and that is get in, in tune with the heavens and not get lost in uh, this uh, war of words and tumult of opinion. this big battle that has been known to Europe for the thousands of years again. But, which assumes that one of those that are <clears throat> battling is, is true. Yeah. And, and, and what we do by, by petitioning God is we get far above that and see that there is a whole different view on yeah. things that anyone on the... He's just saying get out of that, yeah. get up here. Let's, what we need to learn to do is stand on our own ground, on our own revelation. See, the great message of the missionary is we've got to teach you how to pray. You've got to get in and have confidence that you can get an answer, that we right. believe that this James uh, 1 and 5 is as true for you as it was yeah. for Joseph.